Hey everybody, uh, welcome to the Silent Fire podcast. Once again, uh, we are at episode five, and we just had a really funny yeah. blooper moment where we <laughs> started the episode and we were just blankly staring at the screen. So maybe we'll, maybe we'll release bloopers at some yeah, point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but welcome to the podcast. Uh, if you're listening on any of the podcasting platforms or, or watching on the YouTube channel uh, or engaging on Facebook, whatever it is, welcome. Uh, thank you so much for um, watching this and, and a comment, like, share, subscribe, uh, all those things. So uh, I'm Joshua Hoffert. Uh, I'm with Wind Ministries. Uh, you can find out more about Wind Ministries at windministries.ca. Uh, you can find out more about the podcast at silentfire.ca. And I am with Colin Nicole, and I'm the, the parish priest here at St. Mary and St. John, the Anglican churches in Summerside and St. Eleanor's. And you can find us at stmaryandstjohn.com or find me on Facebook. Yes, so, and all that stuff is on the yeah. Silent Fire website. So um, so we're episode five. We've been talking uh, about a number of different things when it comes to really the life of faith mm-hmm. and the mystery of God, the knowledge of God, the life of God, mm-hmm. all this kind of stuff. And and partly partly we wanted to start the, the podcast out with these topics. So really you just got to know, that we got to know each other, yeah. but then you yeah. guys got to know us. And um, the uh, the plan as we roll more episodes out is that we'll be interviewing people and and hearing just different stories and different takes on what it means to encounter the life of God. Um, and so, but this episode here, uh, we're talking about the life of God in the church. Mm-hmm. How do we through um, the collective gathering encounter the life of God? Mm-hmm. And I've been looking forward to having this conversation <laughs> because my background is a charismatic uh, evangelical background. And Colin's background is, I grew up Roman Catholic, but now uh, now Anglican, you know, joined the Anglican Church in, when I was about 18, 19, so. Yeah, so yeah. so we've got, we've just, we're just very different expressions yeah. of um, what what that looks like. And, yeah. and for me, um, when I, I, of course, I mean, I'll, I'll describe some of my, how I see that playing out mm. in the particular way that... Uh, uh, that I've I've seen it throughout my life, uh, but I'll say this when in regards to sacramental liturgical order of service, mm-hmm. um, I I mean I definitely didn't grow up with the like a high type of liturgy sure, right. There's sure. there's I think it's funny I think charismatics have a liturgy they just they just don't call it the liturgy sure. and they don't have a they they have a um, they do it the same way every single Sunday, mm-hmm. but they don't think of the fact that they're honoring a tradition. Right. Right? That's not how we actually approach yeah. it. Um, when I started studying the early church fathers and studying the, the desert fathers in particular mm-hmm. and seeing the, the liturgical practices that they had, um, and then it was a church that I was going to a number of years ago that started running a liturgical communion service. Okay. And... Um, from it was a it was, there was a charismatic Anglican uh, movement that we had kind of participated with, mm-hmm. and that was really my first introduction to liturgy and sacrament. Mm-hmm. Was was uh, and that, and we did the the wine port wine, yeah. you know, drinking from a silver to antioxidants and all that kind of yeah, stuff, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, so we did we actually did it that way, mm-hmm. and and I really loved the contemplative nature of mm-hmm. of. Uh, doing something like that. So that was kind of my first brush, and that was probably five or six years ago, mm-hmm. my first brush with what it looked like to be part of a liturgical sacramental service. Mm-hmm. But it was still being run by people whose background was largely charismatic. Right, right. Mm-hmm. Um, and anyway, so in from my perspective, and in my, in, in, in my experience anyway, having, I mean, traveling all over the place and ministering and, and teaching and, and more charismatic style churches, the um, 
I, I guess I would say that the experience of the life of God is just that. It's an experience. Right. Yeah. And that's kind of what the, depending on the church, but it, it revolves around either, an either or, the experience in worship mm-hmm. or the experience of the preaching and teaching of the word. Sure. Uh, or both. Yeah. Uh, those are kind of the main focal point of an evangelical church service. Mm-hmm. And, you know, or, or you're looking at the Protestant Reformation, even Luther, Protestant Reformation, he wasn't, the, the, the sermon didn't become tantamount then. He was right. still largely Catholic in, in sure. how things were orchestrated and organized. Yeah. Um, but as you, as you go through uh, time and history, the, the teaching of the word becomes the main focal point. Mm-hmm. And then with really with, it seems to me as I've studied it anyway, with the Jesus People Movement, mm-hmm. especially, and the advent of um, uh, acoustic worship and right. things like that that you had in the '70s, yeah. and and the and the influx of media and all of that, mm-hmm. and then especially in, in my background was the Vineyard Church Movement, which was mm-hmm. catalytic for the way um, the way Christian contemporary mm-hmm. worship songs are. I mean, just just even the idea of playing a guitar right. was like anathema at that point. At that point. <laughs> right, right. And it was real it was the hippies really yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Brought, that brought it in that sure. the Jesus people movement in the sixties. Hmm. So largely what, what you see in the charismatic church today is an it is an experience of God through the through the the worship that's sung mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and and the way that the music is sung. And so there, I mean the dangers of that of course is it tends it can tend towards an emotionalism. Right. Um, and it can tends to be me focused. Right. Um, Rather than a, and you look at some of the old hymnals and things like mm-hmm. that, and that tends to be exalting God focused as mm-hmm. opposed to me focused, yeah. um, and and then in the the ultimate form, of course, you've got lights and smoke and all this kind of stuff, yeah. which which the the charismatic would argue that that's no different than the stained glass windows we see around sure, here, sure, yeah. orchestrating something to draw people into sure. the beauty and the and the expression of something. Yeah. So, but but in in yeah, again, in my experience of the the life of God in the church outside we talked about the life of God in the people and their mm-hmm. giving so mm-hmm. we're not talking about that right no. we're just talking about what is what is the how does the church orchestrate itself in a way that displays the life of God mm-hmm. and the charismatic church is largely um, worship focused experience focused mm-hmm. um, or preaching teaching the word yeah. uh, focused and so that's the engagement and I have an uh, Anglican priest friend who anytime he's had me come teach at his church and he's organized um, uh, an event, he never has me, he always schedules me somewhere else on a Sunday morning. Because oh, right. he says, don't speak here, we just have a 10 minute homily. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> but I'll yeah. give you, I'll get you in one of the charismatic or the evangelical sure, churches sure. where um, where they will, they'll have the 45 minute hour long sermon yeah. and, and you'll be better used there. Cool, cool. Um, so that, it's just, a, it's, it's really quite different in, I think it's different in, Style, but in terms of in in the best, you know, the best expression, the, the ethos of it is mm-hmm. probably similar. So I'm curious what your yeah. Well, I mean, I think it, you know, in many ways, it's like uh, we're all we're all kind of pointing towards the same thing, just going about it in these different ways, right? So, um, I mean, for us, uh, I mean, Anglicanism too, you know, throughout the centuries has kind of ebbed and flowed between sure. different you know different traditions. So you know, you go back to um, you know probably after, you know, the 17th century up until close to, you know, the early part of the 19th century. And, and you're finding, uh, you know, um, a very, very word centric, preaching centric kind of worship where, right. you know, the, the Eucharist is not celebrated as frequently as we do today. And, and a lot of what we, um, you know, the ways that we worship today, we, we own in large part to things that happened in the 19th century, right? right. Um, within the Anglican world. And so, uh, I mean, even, you know, I'm from Nova Scotia and even there, and I'm sure in PEI 40 years ago, 50 years ago, it wasn't uncommon to only have communion once a month, right? you know, right. and which uh, is common in the, in evangelical churches, right, yeah. churches. Yeah. So it was, so it was, um, so, so it, you know, when we talk about what is the nature of kind of God in the church and Anglicanism and how do we live that out sacramentally, you know, it's, it's looked differently in different times, but I think we can, we, I can say at least that when you look at, uh, you know, our prayer books, we're not a church too that really has any, like outside of the books that we use for worship. One notable thing about Anglicans is that there's not a, 
there's no kind of uh, confession. There's no, sure. you know, um, you know, we we would just say read the creeds, read the prayer book, read the scriptures, and like that's that's, mm-hmm. um, you know, the the old Latin saying for it is um, lex lexerendi lex credendi. The law of the law of believing is the law of praying. If you want to know what we believe, pray with us, right? Okay, right. Um, and so, <clears throat> and so, uh, but through all of that, you know, I mean, sacramental acts have always been, and the sacraments themselves have been the sort of center point of, of, of the life of God within the church, within the congregation. Mm-hmm. And that's why today, I mean, the majority of Anglican churches, I mean, the principal act of worship every week is Sunday morning when we gather for, for communion. Right. Um, so you know, with, with, with just for some of our, sure, some of the sure. people are there, they may have only have a passing awareness of what the term sacraments mean. Right. So, what right. are some of the common sacraments? I think there's seven sacraments. Right? Well, or yeah, it depends, depends on who you on talk to. It depends okay. on who you talk to. I mean, so, just give us a little bit of that. Sure, uh, sure. What we would say is that, um, and this is what the, prayer, the Book of Common Prayer says, which is that there's two what we call dominical sacraments. So, there's two okay. sacraments that we can attribute to Jesus, right? There is the, the Last Supper, the Eucharist, mm-hmm. and there's baptism. Okay. Um, right. The sacramentals. So, so called, or sometimes people just say the seven sacraments would include things like uh, absolution, marriage, um, a confession and absolution, marriage, um, anointing or unction kind of thing at right. time of death. Um, and so these are definitely sacramental acts, whether you want to call them seven sacraments or two sacraments, you know, that's, that's a whole other podcast. Right, right. <laughs> but, um, right. but, 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 but sacraments themselves are, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, Augustine, uh, is the one that really laid down a good definition of it, which is they are uh, outward and visible signs of an inward, invisible grace. Mm-hmm. Right. So, so when we when we baptize Anglicans for the most part baptize children. So if we baptize a child, um, that is you know it is an outward sign that's being manifested in the community. So the life of God is being you know shown in this in this act and in this community. Of what is inwardly happening in this child, mm-hmm. and, and for us, I mean, I understand probably a lot of the viewers are, you know, not you know, baptizing children would be a, a kind of an anomaly or, or wouldn't sure. happen at all. But um, or, or in the Eucharist, for example, right? I mean, when we consecrate bread and wine at the altar, when the, the prayers are said, um, you know, and we believe that that you know Christ spiritually is present in these this bread and the wine, mm-hmm. that's an outward sign that we can receive and we can right. take part in the life of God through that. Of, of something invisibly happening, right. you know, God's grace within this, and so, um, so that's what sacraments are. Right. And I think I think that's you know the same for marriage. I mean, all of us, you know, even though there's documents that we sign, marriage isn't just some contract. I mean, we right. believe that there is this this grace being. And Paul, you know, Paul says that right exactly. Much, yeah. that marriage displays Christ's love for the church. It's a right. mystery. That, it's a mystery, and, and yeah. it's not so much about marriage. It's about. Jesus and right, his love right. for the people, his love. Yeah, exactly. So it is, yeah. it is a mystery that's an outward display. Yeah. The, one of the things, I think the, the, what I love about the charismatic church, mm-hmm. though, though, again, like I said, it can go to the hyper-emotionalism. Mm-hmm. And then liturgical ser- churches, from, from what I understand also, can go to dry formula right, where people, right. ha- people don't actually engage. Yeah. And, uh, and it just becomes by rote, you say the mm-hmm. same things. Mm-hmm. And I mean that can happen in any in any mm-hmm. particular expression, but the well I, again I think I said this in an early episode. One of my friends says, "Don't it's not a charismatic church; it's churches that have been touched by the charisma right. or the grace of God." Yeah. And that what happens when in a charismatic church is the the central focus becomes encountering the Holy Spirit, mm-hmm. and that's mm-hmm. and that's really what the service ends up revolving around. Mm-hmm. If if you boil it down. And so the, the, the every, every movement is, uh, and so again, that can, that can in its worst form tend towards individualism. Mm-hmm. And one of the beauties I think about a liturgical thing is that everybody's entering into the liturgy mm-hmm. together. Mm-hmm. Um, but one of the beauties of that is centralizing the moment of encounter with the Holy Spirit, mm-hmm. that this is, mm-hmm. this is something that is real and tangible to you. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, and that's, and that's, um, that's the, the the central figure of a charismatic church would be the Holy Spirit is absolutely vital to everything that we do, yeah. and one of the one of the criticisms of 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 typical evangelical I, I can't remember who it was that said this I can think of a couple names but basically people say well for a lot of churches if you remove the Holy Spirit they just continue on without realizing anything happened right. and um, mm-hmm. and so that would happen regardless of the actual expression. Mm-hmm. 
if if it's just well you know if it's a liturgical expression we just do this liturgy um or if it's a hyper emotional service yeah. whatever you're well we're emotional so we don't even realize that what's going on right, right. and i you know part i mean part of me goes i i'm i'm like well i some people don't people aren't always on an emotional high when you mm-hmm. teach people to be on an emotional high they don't know how to deal with the emotional loads yeah. and so there's that part of thing of discovering rhythm and all of that yeah. Um, but but making a central focus the encounter of the Holy Spirit I don't think is necessarily a bad thing mm-hmm. um, and maybe there's better ways that that we could do it and, and I think there is actually there's there's a one of the latest there was a worship album that came out um, and it was a vineyard worship album mm-hmm. and it was they one of the songs they did was um, uh, what's the song uh, the uh, the Kyrie Eliaison, is that what it's called? Kyrie Eliaison, yeah, yes, the Lord the, have mercy. Yeah, yeah, Lord have mercy. And so they, they did that song in a contemporary oh, worship yeah. style. It was beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Right? yeah. And it just, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, yeah. Christ have mercy. Yeah, and just an absolutely beautiful rendition. Mm. And that was kind of, I, lo- I loved it. There was a marrying of some of the modern, uh, modern music that you'd find in sure. evangelical churches. And I know you've talked about, we've, we've had some conversations about you saying what well, you would like to have some, um, some more modern music. Sure. Right? Yeah. 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 Um, anyway. Well, I, and I think, I mean, for, for my part anyway, here or on my end, it's, it's, and the reason that this isn't such an interesting conversation and I'm glad we're able to have it and, and to have this podcast is because I think there's something, you know, in the, in the, Kind of marrying, or the or the the intersection between, as we've said, you know, right. the, the liturgical tradition. I mean, in a way, it's why we're here right now. Yes, you know, yeah. and and the charismatic that it's like, I don't want to say both. We each need each other, but it's like I think you know both spectrums yeah. can really can really help help the other. And and sometimes you're right. You know, we um, there's a great benefit in praying the same prayers every week, but yes. you do fall into there can be a kind of complacency in it where it's right. like you're thinking of your shopping list as you're saying the our father or the, you know, right. whatever, um, where it's like sometimes, you know, having that invigoration of the spirit and having, um, you know, having people just a bit, a bit more, you know, having their heart burn with, right. within them or whatever here right. is, is, right. is, is, is what we, what we want. But, uh, but well, not, and the not heart can burn regardless of what's happening. Oh, for sure. For right. Sure, and yeah, that's, yeah. and that, I remember at one point realizing I went through a season it was, it was probably in the, beginning of me going through a dark night of the soul mm. was realizing that I had like I would put a worship music worship worship album on it I had my you know my my iPod, iPod video at that point right, right. <laughs> remember that, those that things dates you, yes. I do I had one someone stole it from me. and I'd put it I'd put it on I'd put some worship music on yeah. um, whatever kind of uh, whatever band whether it was Bethel Music or mm. Hillsong or mm. United Pursuit or whatever um you know the the popular the popular bands mm-hmm. that have been popular for a long time, or Vineyard Music, mm-hmm. whatever. Um, and and I'd I'd kind of like I'd get tired of the album right. and need to find another one, because right. it just didn't it didn't do it for me in mm-hmm. prayer anymore. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right? And I and eventually I realized actually I'm not really engaging the life of God. I'm being moved by music, right. and not and that that. I don't, I'm not saying there's something wrong with that, mm-hmm. being moved by music, but I realized when I, I was dependent upon a new album that could move me again. Right, right. And I was like, oh, I don't want to be dependent on the music to move me. No. And, and so even, even the formulaic way I approached mm-hmm. devotional life and having the charismatic background and the centrality of the Holy Spirit, I had to relearn how to just be with him yeah. rather than moved by some external mm-hmm. thing that I was dependent on to encounter the presence of God. Yeah. 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 Interesting. And, and it's, I think, I think for us, it's, we do, we do sort of as Anglicans anyway, and, and anyone who's, who's liturgically, you know, in a church that, that practices the sacraments and, and lives those out every Sunday. I mean, it's those sorts of things that we're looking to, to move us. But at the same time, uh, you know, one thing that I feel can sort of fall by the wayside in liturgical churches is um, is the sort of private the private prayer life because sure. it's, it's we're not we're often not looking for it outside of Sunday. Right. I think um, I'm not speaking for for everyone in my congregation, sure, sure. but I know you know you come here and this is sort of the pinnacle of your week. Right. You receive the sacrament and then it's just sort of like okay now what right right uh, and and then, and that's why I mean the Anglican tradition has. Uh, you know, in keeping with the ancient tradition offered, you know, we have services of morning and evening prayer, right? right that are offered. Now, right. it's 
whether people take part in that, and it's it's not always easy. As we you know, the last podcast, it's like, well, I'm busy with work, right? We, we right. talked about yes, that episode. Yes. Um, work has become more important than exactly. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, but certainly, you know, our tradition emphasizes this this life through the week of prayer and, and relationship right. with God that supports uh, and brings you to that Sunday morning, and then kind of leads you out into the yeah. Uh, and I think yeah. any um, you know, and this would get you in trouble depending on what what denominational place you're with but I really any any format that teaches you to be in rhythm with his presence mm-hmm. and to make his presence the central figure in your mm-hmm. life then I can get behind that yeah sure, right sure, I can get sure. behind that and and you can find um, you can find detrimental points of any one of them. I mean, that's one of the reasons Luther nailed the treatises on the right. Catholic Church, right? Yeah, because yeah. it became so egregiously about yeah. power, control, and money and all yeah. that. Um, so it became so depraved, the, the practice, that there was the only, that was the only recourse. Mm-hmm. Really. I mean, some people would criticize him for having done it, but it, it, there really was some sure. very problematic expressions. For sure. And, for so sure. the selling of pew spaces and things oh, like sure. this, right? Yeah, yeah, all that kind of stuff. So, it, it, I mean, the, the heart of man is desperately wicked. Mm-hmm. Right? We talked about that. It, it's, that's, that's, it is still the case. Yeah. That is still the case. Um, and so it, it's, it's, the issue is making Christ the central figure in your life. Mm. And, uh, and, that, and, and again, that, that's, you, have, you have people that move through the motions and you have people that engage life in the same, mm. in, sitting right next to each other, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And, um, mm-hmm. But then you've got people who are on all kinds of different places in their journey and mm. all of that. So um, who's to say if one day, they've, one, one day they're in a charismatic church and they don't encounter God and then they go to a liturgical sure. church and they do mm-hmm. and then vice versa happens. Sure, sure. The, to me, now uh, I... I think that again the intersection. I think the charismatic church could use more liturgy and a, and a greater understanding of um, communion as sacrament and mm-hmm. baptism as sacrament, mm-hmm. um, rather than I mean baptism in a charismatic church essentially becomes or an evangelical church essentially becomes a public declaration of faith, right? And right, it, yeah. and you lose the mystical portion of it, sure. and communion at its worst becomes remember some of your sins and think about Jesus, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, do some repentance yeah. and, and you lose some of the mystical, sure. mystical portion of it. Um, and, and so I did, I definitely have a, a my, my, one of my, one of my desire in doing this is that we kind of broaden our understanding mm-hmm. and see different ways that people approach um, life and faith in God mm-hmm. and realize, Hey, when you're, just the understanding when you're taking communion, you are ingesting the life of God. Yes, yeah, and so. and there's something very real and very true about that. Mm-hmm. When you're when baptism is happening, happening, there's grace that's being conferred. Absolutely. Something mystical is taking place, yeah. Yeah. and um, and even I think it's Paul. He talks about it's in Romans. I can't remember exactly where Romans five or six. He talks about remembering the point of baptism, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. pointing people back to what happened at baptism, mm-hmm. as opposed to just a public. Yeah. Declaration that that they 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 really believe something significant yeah. happened in that particular moment, yeah. and I think if you if you really pressed most charismatics, they would they would believe something significant was sure, happening sure, there. But sure. the background doesn't necessarily doesn't necessarily have that conversation, right? Of right. It. And sac- the the idea of sacrament, the the type that this the term just would be non-existent, right? No, no, yeah. And I mean, even in just thinking about, I mean, liturgical action. Uh, you know, a lot of people think of, you know, when we cross ourselves in church, it's, it's some people would say, well, it's a Roman Catholic thing. I mean, it's really not. It's a, it's a Christian thing, liturgical, a liturgical act. But it's, it's a moment where we remember a baptism. That's what it's all about. Really? I didn't know right? that. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. And ho- holy water, too. You see at the Catholic churches often, you dip your fingers in. It's totally a moment where we're meant to remember a baptism right. and thereby remember who we are in, in, in the life of God, right, in right. God's life. Um, and I remember just when you were talking about, you know, making, making baptism, uh, you know, could be a little bit more liturgical. If you read back into the, I mean, the very early writers of the church, Lactantius or Tertullian, mm-hmm. I can't remember who it was, there's a. I remember reading one time that they were talking about what happens in baptism, and they said they said the, the Holy Spirit in their mind comes upon the water like an unction, like oil, and it's like oil floating right. on the water. And they and they're of course talking about full immersion. Right. And so they said when you go under, I mean you're dead, 
That's right. It's a violent, you're drowning, that's the tomb of Christ, you're, you're gone. Right. And when you come up, you're actually coated in oil. It's like the Holy Spirit covers you like right. unction, like oil, and right. that's how you kind of go out and live your life. Right. And I always thought that's, I mean, it's such a, such a beautiful... Uh, such a beautiful way to think about it. And, and we were talking, you know, uh, we've been doing a study through Lent. We had had to stop now because of coronavirus. But right. the study we were doing through Lent was from um, a brotherhood of uh, Anglican monks in Boston. And it was it was looking at symbols in the church. And, and one of the, the brothers said, you know, there's a real loss sometimes in the way that we do baptism often with the sprinkling of water is like there's a, there's a real loss of meaning in that. Right. You know, when you just put a little bit damp in your forehead. I mean, that's right. not really... That's not really the image. I mean, the image right. of baptism is like you are you know, kind of a new creation in a way, like through right. whether it's through this procl- this faith that you're proclaiming through it, or whether it's through the mystical washing away of sin. Right. Uh, you know, sacramentally, I mean, it's like you're a you're a new a new and different person, and right. and you're kind of drowning. The old self is right. drowning, and does a little bit of water really convey that, or you know, should it right. be right. You know, held under for a couple well, seconds? And, that makes me think there would we one of the things when you're talking about the the public display of the gifts that's one mm. of the things that charismatic churches have been known for mm. um, it, the a, a prophetic act yeah. would be something that would be welcomed mm. and something that would be invited yeah. um, and and that kind of language is essentially m- means I don't want to equate the two but essentially the idea behind it is you're making something display that God's doing in the spirit right Right, so there's, there's, you could almost talk of, it'd almost be easier for some, for us to think of the sacrament of communion as a prophetic act declaring that the life right. of God is within. I was going to say that sounds pretty sacramental. It does, it <laughs> is, said, and yeah. and even yeah. even in worship, like the oftentimes when say a worship leader they'll be worship leading worship and they'll just be like, man, the people are just not responding, mm. and they'll be, like, let's stand up mm-hmm. and let's let's. Re- re- reinvigorate and renew our praise to yeah. Jesus, right? There's a prophetic act is standing up. Right. And right. so there's almost this, we just, we think of it differently mm-hmm. and use different language. Mm-hmm. And, and because part of, part of the, the, my critique of the evangelical church would be it's divorced from the history right. of the church. Um, so we don't think of it in terms of what the early church fathers would talk yeah. about. Um, and so we have different language, but we're still trying to, assume the same type of posture mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and the same thing mm-hmm. through a prophetic act. Like I'm a, my, my prophetic act would be um, death and burial, resurrection, right, in, mm-hmm. in baptism. So mm-hmm. there definitely, or a prophetic act might be, you know, pastors preached a sermon that stirs people, come down to the front yeah, yeah. and declare to yourself, this is a prophetic act that you're coming down. Mm-hmm. And it's almost like mm-hmm. all these movements. So that, And that's the thing is we just don't have the same language. Right. But we're trying to display some of the same things. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Wow, cool. Good. Yes, yeah. So it's it's again the the, cent, the centrality of encountering the Holy Spirit mm-hmm. of your life being transformed. What does that look like? And I I would like to see it, like our I've told you before that the church that I attend we have we do communion every week. Yeah. Um, and. And I like that that's communions. Is, and sometimes we do it collectively as a church body. And sometimes we do even do have it done it liturgically mm-hmm. where we have some prayers and statements that are said. And then sometimes we do it where we gather in groups of five to 12 right. and pray together. Okay. Um, yeah. And so there's, there's ways that, that we, we try to explore that. And I think there's more of a movement um, within the evangelical church to explore some of the historic roots. Yeah. And, yeah. To, mm-hmm. and to say, hey, look... Those Anglicans over there, we've got some holy jealousy, right? <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, <laughs> we like yeah. that rhythm that they're that they're establishing. In their yeah. yeah, yeah. So good. Well, thank you everyone for tuning in, and we're keen to hear what you think. So, comment, email, like, subscribe, share, and uh, let us know about you know ways that you've seen uh, God's life. Uh, being lived out in the church and in in that sort of community, and uh, check us out on Facebook and yep. stay tuned. We're going to be. Uh, uh, what's coming next is uh, interviews with various people uh, where you can stop hearing just from us and throw someone else in the mix. But, uh, but thank you for watching, and we look forward to hearing from you. God bless.